everyone, I'm Victoria Blake, the Sustainability Manager at the Bay of Plenty District Health Board, and I'm proud to facilitate the second part of our climate change mitigation at District Health Board's webinars. Today's webinar will focus on what DHBs are doing to mitigate emissions from travel, waste and procurement. It will give an overview of the innovation, challenges and opportunities for addressing the environmental harm from these activities, and will be presented by Dagan Eager and Jay Hadfield. Dagan Eager has been the Sustainability Officer at Mid-Central DHB since the role was created 18 months ago. He has a Master's in Public Health focusing on the strengthening and transformation of health systems. Prior to taking up the role at Mid-Central, he worked for health rights NGOs in Southern Africa on promoting equity and access to healthcare services. He now lives in Palmerston North and has been in New Zealand for over four years. Today, Dagan will be discussing waste management and minimisation in a complex healthcare setting and identifying the importance of sustainable procurement. Jay Hadfield is the Senior Sustainability Advisor at Capital and Coast DHB. He has worked in the sustainability space for around five years, both in policy and operational roles. Having initially worked at the Ministry for the Environment and the Resource Efficiency and Innovation team, Jay brings a strategic view of the waste sector to Capital and Coast's waste challenges. Holding a degree in Performing Arts Management, Jay has a unique view of the sustainability space with a focus on people, relationships and building coalitions to reach common goals. He is fresh to the health sector and has been in his role for 18 months. Today, Jay will be speaking to the work Capital and Coast is doing to improve transport options for staff, including active and public transport, as well as the complexity of air travel and the impacts of COVID-19. So without further ado, let's get on with the presentation. Please remember to ask your questions in the question and answer panel as we go. Jay, over to you. As Victoria said, uh, I will be talking to uh, the transport emissions um, and some of the challenges and opportunities that we have to address that. Um, so a bit of perspective on what transport is in a health context. So we have a unique um, use of our fleet vehicles. At Capital and Coast, we have about 266 vehicles, uh, and that um, represents only about 3% of our total emissions. So while it sounds like we have a lot of vehicles in, in the greater scheme of things, uh, compared to other, other activities, it doesn't actually make up a large proportion of our emission profile. Um, part of that is, though we have lots of vehicles, those vehicles don't do a lot of distance. So. Uh, our district nurses and mental health teams um, and the various other groups that, that use those vehicles to reach into our communities will travel a short distance and spend a lot of time at each destination. They often have optimised routes that reduce the amount of time they have to spend in the car driving because we really value the clinician's time um, over the efficiency of the car as you might look at it in a, another context in terms of fleet optimisation. Um, part of that is, is that we treat transport as a service, so transport is an enabler of us delivering health services rather than a core activity that DHBs have to do. That actually kind of flows on to some of the challenges in that the, um, the way that electric vehicles and electrification of fleets stacks up uh, for other businesses who do a lot of kilometres where the operational efficiencies of an electric vehicle or a hybrid vehicle can offset the initial capital or lease cost of those vehicles uh, doesn't work for us. So the um, the vehicles that we use are both quite small. You can see the Suzuki Swift there. Uh, they also don't do many kilometres, so the fuel expenditure isn't that high to begin with. Uh, and so we really struggle getting that to, to make sense for us. Um, we are, however, uh, there's some expectations from government um, and the public, I guess, that I'll speak to uh, kind of at the end of, of my little spiel. Um, Dagan, if we could just go on to the next slide. So the other half of the coin and the transport game is how our staff get to work. Um, we have our DHBs across the country are large organisations, um, lots of staff and lots of shift workers. And certainly in Wellington and, and uh, lots of other parts of the country, shift workers who start early in the morning or finish late at night aren't well served by public transport. And though uh, here on, in Wellington, our side is right outside, or right right beside a, a major bus hub. The buses still don't work very well for our staff who are starting early in the morning. And so, therefore, a lot of our staff um, uh, have little other options 
than to drive. And so we estimate that there are around 1,400 staff who park on our sites, primarily in Wellington and also our other major hospital in Kinaparu and Paiura. Um, and then there's another 800 who are parking on neighbouring streets. That is a challenge both in terms of we don't really want that many staff driving to work, but that overflow uh, beyond what we have capacity for parking on site has a really significant negative impact on our community. And so there's uh, a bit of a crossover and the challenges are a bit broader than a pure emissions and sustainability um, view where if we want to be good neighbours, we really need to be working on how we can offer our staff better choices, really. Um, and so that's that's a focus for the DHB, and it's acknowledging that uh, we don't have all of the, the levers to, to help our staff and encourage our staff to use alternative um, solutions. There is also the onflower for impact of having our staff parking at capacity where um, there are issues where patients are unable to find a park. And this is an issue that is also felt in other DHBs, largely the ones in metropolitan areas, um, like in Auckland, um, and you're probably aware of the issues in Christchurch, uh, where you see um, high rates or higher rates of missed appointments due to inability to find a park, or people are late to appointments, and there's obviously the on-flow impacts of that on on health. So that brings us to like, how do we actually solve this? And acknowledging that DHBs don't have all the levers, um, either because we, we don't control or because, uh, as is in the case with air travel, particularly for our senior medical officers with uh, CME allowances, we don't have um, a lot of control over how that happens and how that money can be spent. So as you would have seen in the previous slide, our business travel is a second highest emission source. So that's something that um, is somewhat outside of our, uh, our control. Uh, but um, yeah, is, if we can go to the next slide, Dagan kind of speaks to uh, what the solutions are. Um, and so part of that is uh, we are receiving instruction that enables our board and our chief executives for the DHPs across the country uh, to make changes to um, our policies and to encourage and work with our union partners to affect changes in mechas and to change uh, how we handle parking and how we enable people to get to work. So that's stuff like the broader outcomes rules in procurement, um, which require public sector agencies to have new vehicles into fleets be 20% more efficient than the existing fleet average. Uh, the Prime Minister also sent a letter recently to public sector CEs uh, which is really spurring a lot of action, certainly at CCDHB, really encouraging public sector agencies to focus on a uh, carbon zero fleet by 2050, sorry, 2025 target, which is very ambitious for us. Um, on the other hand, we also have pressures in, in their own infrastructure requirements. Uh, and that's really where it comes in. I think we don't hold all the, legal, the local or the regional levers. Um, regional councils, territorial authorities all have lots of options in terms of policy and infrastructure services, so buses, uh, bus stops, timetables for public transport, um, bus priority lanes uh, sit with territorial authorities or, or district councils, um, and cycleways as well. And it's, I think, going back to that uh, working with others, the health sector is a direct beneficiary of increased uses of public and active transport from physical activity and mental health outcomes. And um, there are some really fantastic sustainability outcomes as well. So I think the, the solutions for us are really focused on finding where there are common goals and multiple positive outcomes for different agencies, um, some who might have funding support, others who have policy levers uh, and getting everyone in the room and, and being able to move forward enables us to, to reach where we want to get to. Um, so I think that's all from me, and I'll flick it over to Dagan to cover off the next bit. So what I'm going to be talking to you about is um, waste management at DHBs and what DHBs are doing uh, to minimise the environmental harms from their waste. Um, something we need to recognise is, is that solid waste is is a, only a small, only accounts for a small portion of 
BHB emissions between five and 10% on average. Um, the thing with solid waste though, it's often the most visible aspect of um, a DHB's environmental harms and, and downstream emissions. So it's one that there's a, a lot of demand from within the DHBs to deal with and manage. Uh, the thing about waste man management, particularly in, in hospital and large healthcare institutions, is that these institutions are very often complex settings. Um, and what I mean by complex settings is there are many departments with many moving parts, um, all playing different functions. Uh, we have visitors, we have patients, all coming in and converging within these spaces, consuming goods, whether for medical treatments um, or, or through general waste and producing waste. Um, within DHBs, there are two different waste streams, each with their own unique challenges. Um, the first would be the production of large volumes of, of food and, and general mixed waste, much in the same way as um, any other institution would produce, a university um, or corporate organization. And then there are also harmful, potentially environmentally harmful waste streams that come from medical processes and medical practice. Um, so medical waste, very often biohazardous or um, chemically hazardous to the environment that need to be managed in very um, regulated and controlled ways. So when we're thinking about this complexity, it's a bit of a juggling act for, for DHBs to think about creative solutions for, in the first instance, minimizing our waste um, and then better managing what we do with it once it's being produced. Um, so what are DHBs doing? Um, one of the, the more popular and, and front-facing um, ways DHBs are approaching the management of waste is looking at, at food waste. Um, most DHBs produce several thousand meals a day, um, either through um, meal services to patients um, or through the provision of meals in staff and, and visitor cafes. Um, so how do we think about managing food waste? Um, one thing DHVs are doing are, are moving towards compostable packaging, um, packaging that can either be composted in, in commercial compost sites um, or can be recycled. Um, several DHBs, um, ours included, are starting to trial commercial composting relationships. Um, in Palmerston North, for example, we have a um, commercial compost that run by the, the city council who we're starting to enter a relationship to get them to, to start taking our, our compostable waste, inclu including our food compostables. Um, and those are composted and then sold off um, to members of the public. Um, Counties Manukau have a, a creative solution for their food waste. Um, they partnered with a local school to set up the, um, uh, worm farms. Um, food waste from the hospital is then fed into the worm farms and the compost that's produced from that process is used on the school's um, agriculture plots um, where they teach students how to produce food. Um, and therefore completing the circle and providing back to the community at the same time as reducing food waste. Um, there are also technological solutions that are being used to manage uh, food waste. These include um, commercial uh, food waste digesters. These process food waste into um, liquid form um, and those liquids can then either be used as compostables or are then um, shifted down the drain with the, the dry material that's left over disposed of in, in landfill. And then the last approach um, several DHBs are trialing is Meat Free Monday, so reducing the quantity of, of meat that goes into, into meals that are being produced. Um, that reduction then has, has upstream effects by reducing um, the production of, of methane and other gases through, through um, meat production um, at source. Um, another really important um, intervention or several interventions that DHBs are pursuing um, are looking at, at mixed recycling, 
um, putting mixed recycling in public spaces and in offices. And, and most DHBs now are progressing towards some sort of mixed recycling uh, program. Um, and, and this is across things like cardboard, um, glass and, and plastics. Uh, these are often the most difficult um, waste management strategies to implement because you've got a diverse set of um, role players that you need to manage and, and ensure waste stream segregation. So this is, this is an area that we find really challenging with, with getting people, particularly members of the public, to cooperate in, in segregating their waste and managing them properly. Um, an area that's become increasingly popular within, within clinical settings and, and one that um, we quite enjoy implementing within our, our DHBs is looking for solutions for, for medical waste, looking for solutions for managing waste that traditionally um, would need to be autoclaved or incinerated um, and finding solutions for, for how we can have those materials recycled. Um, Johnson & Johnson's, for example, is partnering with, with uh, several DHBs to pilot a program of, of recycling and managing recycling of, of medical waste, um, single-use instruments. Um, these are torn down into component parts and, and plastic components and, and metal components are then um, separately streamed and recycled separately. Um, a a, a longish standing um, initiative run by, by many DHBs is the recycling of, of PVC, so PVC infusion bags. Um, these infusion bags are then taken off and reprocessed into, into PVC pellets, which are then used as, as um, instead of virgin materials in producing PVC products. Um, and then one of the, the last and, and developing more creative ways of, of minimizing um, medical waste is through reprocessing of, of medical items. Um, there's a, a company that was set up by a really young um, driven um, CEO, Oliver Hunt, who set up MedSalve. MedSalve are taking um, patient transfer mattresses, reprocessing them and reselling them to DHBs, um, as well as DVT sleeves. Um, and several DHBs are now piloting the collection and, and reuse of these traditionally single-use products. So the management of waste is stretches across um, the broad spectrum of, of waste production areas from um, non-hazardous to hazardous waste. But the thing I think we all need to realize and, and the thing that's probably the most difficult for us to manage within DHBs in, in reducing our carbon emissions is looking at how we pre prevent production of waste in the first instance. Um, data from the NHS shows that about 61% of a DHB or, or a hospital's emissions in, in the UK come from procurement. Um, and the emissions there are upstream indirect emissions through the things like the production of, of, of materials and goods that are then shipped to, to hospitals, um, the transports of, of goods from suppliers to, to their points of use. Um, so we really need to start thinking about creative ways of managing um, procurement waste and minimizing it before it actually gets produced at DHBs. Um, the one solution that we were some of us are looking at um, is, is building in sustainable principles, waste reduction principles into our procurement processes. Um, this has become a, a, a part of the all of government procurement rules. And we are now required across at least infrastructure in several areas of our, our production to include sustainable management and ask our suppliers um, to manage in their own production processes and within their own corporate processes, the minimization of, of carbon production. Um, Jay, is there anything that you want to say on, on procurement? Yeah, so I guess the, um, what Dagan's covered there is really about uh, at the analysis stage of tendering. What well, one of the things that we're looking at here that is hopefully going to work for us well um, is actually kind of the step before that. So when a business case is being prepared, uh, we are investigating whether we can require all business cases to be passed through both our energy T 
team um, and our sustainability team so that we can really get a sense for what are the operating uh, costs and climate impacts of that from an energy perspective, as well as whether there are any sustainability opportunities um, or impacts from the activities that we're looking at doing in the first place. So really trying to uh, get in front of that ball, I guess, so that we're not permanently in a reactionary state. Um, and I'll, we can let you know how that goes once we've once we've gone a bit further down the track on that one. All right. Well, um, thank you, Dagan and Jay. I see that we've had a few um, questions come through. So, Dagan and Jay, if I can just get you to put your videos on so that we can see your lovely faces, um, and I will go through the questions. But please, you know, if you've got any questions as we go through the conversation, please feel free to pop them in the Q and A um, panel there. Um, and I'm just pretty much going to start at the top. So a question from Brad is asking, how can we encourage more cycling to work for DHB staff? So I guess that's one for you, Jay. What have you been doing in that space? Yeah, for sure. So I think there's there's kind of two parts to that in terms of a solution, and one of them is at the DHB in providing good end of trip services. Um, so we, that's uh, secure bike storage as well as lockers and changing rooms to get changed in. Um, and then the, the piece that I think is the really tough nut to crack uh, from a DHB perspective is convincing the local council to invest in cycleways because that is fundamentally the barrier for most people. I think if you look at who, will, who might ride a bike to work, um, there's a few percent who will ride in traffic and then it's not until you get down into... Um, the people that are comfortable, uh, I'm sorry, who will only ride on a separated cycleway, you get any kind of scale in terms of people who will use a bike. Um, so yeah, and that, that is a, that's a tough bit because we don't hold that that level. We can't make the council invest. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, one for you, Dagan. Um, so as Tom saying, as I understand it, in terms of management of the plastic stream from a recycling perspective, um, so-called compostable plastics are a real problem. Do you have much to say on that? Yeah, so when we were looking at, at bringing compostable packaging, takeaway packaging um, into our cafe, um, we explored the compo so-called compostable plastics. And one of the things we, well, there, there are two problems with it. The one is they don't actually compost all that well, even in the commercial composting um, sites. They take a lot longer um, and sometimes don't break down adequately. Um, so our commercial compost is not too keen on, on receiving those. Um, and then the other one is, is looking at the harms um, that go into the production of, of those, those so-called um, compostable plastics. Um, many of them are produced in countries where we just don't know what the, the processes are used in the production of the plastics. Um, we have some sense that the working conditions um, and the chemicals used in the production of those compostable plastics are pretty bad for the environment. So those things we're holding off at the moment um, until there's a, we're confident enough that one, they can be composted properly and two, um, where they produce, we're not causing more harms and externalizing um, the harms, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Um, so it is a real problem for us. Uh, Jay, one for you. Are there any initiatives um, to encourage staff to park a short distance away in a designated cheaper car parks and use a car bike scooter combo to finish the journey actively? Um, and are you doing any work in the car sharing space? So what sort of, I guess, what sort of work are you, is happening to engage staff to get to work in a different way? Yeah, for sure. So uh, specifically for us, unfortunately, where Wellington Hospital is, there isn't really any um, short distance where we could have another car park. Uh, the city's pretty dense and we're on the south side of the CBD, so the potential for that is kind of not there, I guess. Um, on a more broad level, I guess, there is certainly a place for park and ride in the solution, be that riding a bike or riding a train or riding a bus, whatever that is. Um, but I think we need to be really clear about why we're doing it. And um, yeah, you've kind of got to be careful that you don't discourage whole trip solution because you make the, the park and ride too easy. Um, so yeah, it's kind of, I guess, a balancing act on that one. And in terms of car sharing, I think that's a really exciting opportunity, not just for 
um, is it, there's two kinds of car sharing, right? There's carpooling to get to work, and we have some notice boards for people to try to tr kind of connect there. Um, the other the other side of that is the the Mevos or the um, the Zilch or City Hop kind of that kind of car share, and I think that there's a really exciting opportunity there for our fleets to try and improve the utilisation of those. Um, we have quite a peaky usage of that, so it's, it's basically a, a normal distribution through the day. And so part of the reason why our cars do so little driving is that they're sitting around until 10 and then they're back by four. Um, and so that there are vehicles that are, they're obviously got embodied carbon sitting around doing nothing uh, that can be used by other people. And it also enables us to get some of that electrification happening and offsetting some of the capital costs. So car is great. Um, it's contractually difficult, but you know, keep working on it, right? Great. Um, I want it back to you, Dagan, um, and this is a curly one. So how much has infection control and food safety regulation roles and legislation an unreasonable barrier to reducing waste, so both medical and food waste? Um, I haven't found either of those to be a, a significant barrier. In, infection control is a key partner. Um, everything we do that's in, in, in a clinical space, whether it's mixed recycling or medical recycling, um, is, is done with infection control and discussed. Um, I think what's really great is that when we do try to initiate um, schemes within clinical spaces, particularly around medical recycling, whether it's single use instruments or PVC recycling, is the people that are, are participating in those programs um, are very motivated to keep infection control in place and to manage those waste streams just as they would whether they were disposing those waste streams in, in sharp spins containers or in, in the medical waste bins. Um, and I think infection control knows that and as long as that's managed within the spaces it's, it's not a barrier. Um, in, infection control has actually been really useful for us is they've identified areas of, of waste that are going into to sharp spins for example uh, for example, that, that really shouldn't, and, and finding solutions for how we can get it out of there and into a, into a, a recyclable um, bin. Um, food regulations, the same, as long as we follow the processes and integrate within the processes, people don't tend to, to put up too much of a barrier. And, and I find that people are, are quite keen to participate, so, so we, we make it work. Great. I think um, we've only really got time for one more question. And so I'm going to go to this one um, from David Geller, who says, thanks to you guys. Um, he really likes the idea of business cases being assessed by um, for their environmental cost or opportunity. Um, what would that take by the way of organisational will, resource and expertise? Yeah, so I guess I can really quickly um, try and address that. So what we've got currently, what we've already rolled out is a section in our business cases that asks people to note environmental impact. Um, the vast majority of people have just gone, that's too hard and said not applicable, which is obviously not the case. Um, so that's why we're kind of having to look at a bit more of a requirement and definitely conscious of the significant potential workload that that creates. I think the thing that's key is really picking which, which of those business cases um, are of the scale and potential impact or opportunity to warrant a lot of effort um, and uh, which you can kind of just let go through. Um, and the more will and resource, it's, it's I guess how long is a piece of string, right? So the more resource, the more will uh, that you've got, the more expertise you have, the more you can do. Um, but doing anything is better than nothing. So we'll start and we'll see what it, what we get. Um, so we are just about out of time. So I just want to thank you um, so much, Jay and Dagan, for your time and insight today. Um, and a big shout out to Otago University for their ongoing support with this webinar series. Our next webinar will be on September 22nd, uh, where Dr. Nikki Hari will discuss climate change in the infinite game, answering four essential questions. So until then, kā kite